Hello students, welcome back to our course Environmental Modeling and Simulation. In today's lecture, we will continue our discussion on environmental non-reactive and reactive processes. Today we are going to talk about bio-uptake to begin with. Bio-uptake is when a biological entity, whether it is fish or a human being or smaller orders of life like algae, bacteria, they uptake a contaminant that is present in the environment. Now there are various ways with which uh, an organism can uptake the contaminant present in its environment. For example, we have ingestion, we have dermal contact, so let me write these down. Ingestion. For example, a human being consumes a fish that has certain levels of mercury in it, then that mercury is ingested in the body of the human being and then it can stay in the body of the human being, some percentage of it. The other is dermal contact. So in case of dermal contact via absorption, some part of the contaminant can enter the body. Then we have the other uptake route, which is inhalation, where an organism that breathes, that respires, could inhale the contaminant from the environment. For example, when lead was added into petroleum products to make the engines run better, inhalation of the fumes was the major source of uh, uptake of the contaminant by human beings across the globe. So uh, when an animal, when an organism ingests, comes into contact or inhales a contaminant in the environment, we see that there are three different ways in which the contaminant stays in the body and increases in the body. The first is bioconcentration and bioconcentration is directly linked with dermal contact. bioconcentration which is directly linked with dermal contact. So in bioconcentration what will happen, so let us say we have a fish. And the fish is in surrounded by mercury laden water and then from the gills of the fish, it is quite possible that mercury will enter the body of the fish and over the lifespan of the fish it will concentrate because the fish is interacting with water every day, every moment. This is bioconcentration. Then um, the other possibility is that some other organism, a bigger fish or a human being will eat this fish and all the mercury that's present in the fish will be taken up by another animal. And that animal, the other animal, let's just call it the bigger animal, bigger fish. The bigger fish or animal might consume thousands of such fishes in their life. So the amount of mercury in their body by mass would be 1000 times just by ingestion of the fish, 1000 times average of an average fish that they consume. This is known as biomagnification. One thing to note is that biomagnification happens on multiple different trophic levels. Whereas bioconcentration happens on the same trophic level and bioaccumulation also happens on the same trophic level. So for example, a singular fish consuming mercury via ingestion of water by uh, coming in contact via gills with the mercury laden water, this is happening on the same trophic level. Now if this fish is eaten by other animals, human beings, then the, the accumulation is happening on a different trophic level and that's why it's called as biomagnification. Now the question is what's the difference between bioconcentration and bioaccumulation? Bioconcentration is via dermal contact. So via dermal contact, how much ever contaminants will pass into the body, out of the body, that represents bioconcentration. Bioaccumulation on the other hand accounts for all forms of um, accumulating or receiving the contaminant. So ingestion, dermal contact, inhalation and all other possible forms, uh, in some cases injection will be accounted for in bioaccumulation. So the difference basically between bioconcentration and bioaccumulation is that dermal contact bioconcentration, all exposure routes bioaccumulation and happening on different, if the con, um, intake of the contaminant is happening on a different trophic level, then it is biomagnification. Another example is for example, um, the certain recalcitrant pesticides are present in the grass or in the food that the cow is eating or the buffalo is eating. And then they accumulate, bioaccumulate or bio, bioaccumulate in the body of that animal 
cow or buffalo over time and let's say they do pass the milk barrier and they enter the milk of the animal and then we consume the milk. Now we are getting exposed to those recalcitrant toxins, recalcitrant pesticides on a different trophic level that is biomagnification. Okay, so uh, how do we model bioconcentration, bioaccumulation and biomagnification? Biomagnification is a little tricky. Uh, however, it can be very, it can be oversimplified simply by saying if we know the intake rate of this particular animal at this trophic level, we know the intake of the fishes that that animal is eating. For example, if you are talking about humans who consume fish then uh, or milk products or any other animal product or plant product even, then our uh, target trophic level is that of humans. And then if we know the rate at which they are ingesting the contaminated food, whether it is plant or fish or milk or other animal products, then we can very easily average out and find out what level of contaminant will biomagnify in the body of this human. Now with bioaccumulation also if we know the exposure, all exposure route, how much of the contaminant is entering the body over lifespan or over a particular given duration of time, we can calculate bioaccumulation. Now bioconcentration behaves very similarly to that of fish. So what I am going to do is, I'm, when bioconcentration is relatively easier to model, so I am going to show you how we model bioconcentration. Remember all these processes whether it is bioconcentration, bioaccumulation or biomagnification, they, we do not look at them in isolation, we look at them in maybe a mass balance, maybe we are writing an ODE and we need, an, need a term that accounts for either of these three phenomena. So let us look at bioconcentration. Let us take the example of a fish. The fish is swimming in the water and let us say the concentration of the contaminant in the body of the fish is F. Now there are many assumptions we are making here. One of the assumptions is that the contaminant is evenly distributed across the body. We know some contaminants tend to accumulate in certain organs in kidneys or liver or certain bone muscle tissues or neurons and brain. So we know that contaminants tend to have a preference of which part of the body they will accumulate in. But uh, let us say this is evenly distributed and the concentration of the contaminant in the fish body is F. We want to find out how this concentration is changing over time because of bioconcentration. So uh, let us say the rate at which the uh, F, the concentration of contaminant in the fish body is changing with time is given by dF by dt. So it is the rate at which the contaminant is changing in the body. Now this will be uh, equal to Remember, we are still doing the mass balance, right? Df by dt, rate of change of concentration, if you remember, is equal to input. So, inlet, how much is coming in, minus output, minus outlet, how much is leaving the system, plus accumulation, minus decay. So, we are still using this mass balance or material balance system that we did earlier. So, input is how much the body of the fish is getting just by existing in the water, how much they are inputting by being in contact with the water whether it is through the gills, entering through the gills or trans, uh, diffusing through the skin, the barrier. So uh, this is basically going to be, uh, this is going to be dependent on the concentration. So the input is going to be dependent on the concentration of the contaminant in water because it is passing through the skin barrier, the higher the concentration in the skin the faster the uh, diffusion would be, the faster the transmission of the contaminant would be. Now output is what is known as depuration. Basically it is excretion of the contaminant. Uh, fish are living organisms, so they consume and they also excrete. Same thing with us, we consume products and we also excrete products. So let us say somebody is exposed to certain heavy metal via dermal contact their body will work hard to get rid of it. So the liver and kidney and other organs of the body will work hard to get rid of it. So that is depuration, the body is trying to get rid of it. Accumulation is in case the fish body is automatically generating those toxins which in this case is not what we are looking at. We are looking at a kind of pollutant that is anthropogenic in source and was released into the fish's environment by human beings. So accumulation in this case is going to be zero. Also we are assuming that this contaminant we are talking about, this toxicant we are talking about does not degrade very rapidly, so we can also ignore the decay. This will not be true for all kind of contaminants. Some contaminants do degrade in the body, there are certain um, 
products that we human beings consume on a regular basis and they are sort of a toxic for our body but we do still consume them and then our liver breaks them down. So some toxicants do degrade in the body but that's not what we're looking at here. So basically we know that the rate at which the concentration of toxicant in the fish body F will change with time will be equal to one term that represents intake of the contaminant minus one term that represents the depuration, the removal of contaminant from the fish's body. Now we know that the depuration is proportional to the concentration in the fish body. Let us look at it. This is intake, depuration. So intake of the contaminant from the environment will be proportional to the concentration of the contaminant in the environment. However, depuration, removal of the contaminant from the fish's body will be proportional to the concentration of the contaminant in the fish body. Think of it this way. This is the body of the fish and now this is the ambient environment. And this is the body. Concentration here at any given time is F. Concentration here in the water is any, at any given time is Cw. The input, the inflow of contaminant from the water to the body will be proportional to Cw. The out, the depuration, from the body would be proportional to the concentration in the body F. So we know that how we know that these two terms will be proportional to what particular uh, concentration of the contaminant. Now let us write the terms down. So with depuration it is pretty simple. Uh, it is almost a linear relationship between the concentration of the contaminant in fish's body and the rate at which it excretes. So it is a good assumption to say that depuration will be equal to K2F. K2F, this so we can replace here. So we can write df by dt, leaving space for input term here minus K2F. So intake is going to be proportional to Cw. So we need a proportionality constant here. So let's say the proportionality constant is the capital K Cw. Now let's look into K more in depth. How does the fish take in the contaminant from the water into its body? Now there has to be a transfer rate constant. K1 and there is another thing how fast can the fish's gills take the contaminant in. This will vary from one fish to another. So for one fish maybe it has higher tendency to take in the contaminant via its gills and the other fish has lesser. So we need a term that is particular to the fish. So the capital K here is actually a product of two different constants. One constant tells me how what is the rate constant for the transfer of contaminant from water to fish's body. The other is the constant that tells me how fast the fish's gills take up the contaminant and result in bioconcentration. So what we end up with is then df by dt, the rate at which the contaminant concentration which is f is changing with time in fish's body is equal to two constants multiplied into Cw minus K2f. Okay, so this is our uh, rate equation and now let us look at what happens at steady state. As you know at steady state df by dt will be 0 which means the concentration of the contaminant in fish's body is no longer changing. The rate at which it is intaking is equal to the rate at which it is depuring the contaminant. So df by dt will become equal to 0 which means the RHS becomes 0. So if you look at it this way, we have Cw which is concentration of contaminant in water which we can measure. We have these constants which we can figure out for a given contaminant and for the given fish and K2 is the rate at which the fish excretes. So it has to be proportional. It is the rate constant which we can figure out. Now when we equate this equal to 0, we get very simply So the concentration of the contaminant in fish's body is given by basically the concentration of contaminant in fish's body and the concentration of contaminant in the water are directly proportional to each other. They are linearly proportional to each other at steady state. So we can define a new constant here and that new constant typically is written as BCF which is bioconcentration factor into concentration of the contaminant in the water. Now please note that this is very similar to adsorption isotherms when we are assuming linearity. So if you remember uh, we used the, the constant we used then was Kf. So 
uh, this is bio concentration for you all now let's solve a question let's look at a question and see how we'll solve it so again we are going to stick with the example of a fish the question goes like this we have a pesticide a new pesticide that's released into the lake and we want to find out what is the extent of bio concentration that's happening so um, let's say it has suspended solids and the concentration of suspended solids is given to us as 20 milligram per liter right so remember the the terms that we defined in the previous lecture we can use pw is equal to 20 milligram per liter the other thing we are given is that the water solid partition coefficient of the pesticide is around 10000 liter per kilogram water solid partition coefficient means we know the value of kf kf is roughly 10000 liter per kilogram now the other thing we are told is that the bcf if you remember what we defined BCF as in the previous slide, NK1 by K2. So, for a given fish, for a given contaminant in the general chemistry of surface water, we can find out the BCFs and use them. So, let us say the BCF of the pesticide is also given as 10,000, same values, liter per kilogram. And the question is find the total concentration of the contaminant in the lake. We have to find CT, total concentration. Remember, CT is equal to concentration in water plus concentration in particulate matter. So, uh, we did this in the last class very briefly. So, here is a revision. The contaminant pesticide will be in the particulate phase and also in the dissolved phase in the water. And what we are interested in, what is the total concentration of pesticide permissible in the lake so that the fish is still safe to eat. So, we need to know what level of the contaminant, what level of pesticide is considered safe in the fish. So, let us say that concentration is given to us as 0.3 ppm. Okay, and now we have to find out the CT. So, how you will go about this? We know BCF, we know the concentration in fish. So, if you look at our previous slide, F is equal to BCF CW, F is equal to BCF CW. We know F. 0.3 parts per million, we know BCF 10,000 liter per kilogram, we can find out the concentration that is permissible in the water and once we know this we can find out CP and then we can calculate CT. Okay, so let us find out CW. CW is equal to F by BCF, please be very careful about the units, make sure that you, you, you are consistent in your use of units. So, uh, let us put in the values, we have 0.3 gram by 10 to the power 6 gram. I want to take a moment here and spend some time talking about the unit ppm or ppb in environmental sciences. In environmental sciences, we find out the concentration of the contaminant in liquids, in solids and in air. And um, the ppm means slightly different things in each of the phases. For example, uh, ppm in general means parts per million, right? And in case of ppb, it is parts per billion. Now, here is something that is noteworthy. Parts per million of what? Parts per million, yeah. So, parts per million of what? Parts per million of solid, parts per million of liquid or of gas. Typically, when we are talking about fluids, typically, not always, unless mentioned otherwise, we are always talking about mass by volume. So, for example, if I am interested in the concentration of contaminant in water, which is CW, and I say, oh, it is these many ppm, then I am probably talking about milligram per liter or gram per liter or microgram per liter. So, what is this? This is mass per volume, right? But again, I can refer it to as ppm without being specific that I am talking about mass per volume. It is conventional that in liquid, in solutions, when we say ppm, we are talking about mass per volume. In air, when we are talking about ppm, let us say the concentration of a particular contaminant is 1 ppm or the concentration of carbon dioxide is 400 ppm. In air, we are talking about volume by volume. So, when we say let us say concentration of a certain gas is 420 parts per million, what we are saying is it is 420 liter by 10 to the power 6 liter of air. So, this is volume by volume. In solids like in this case, we are talking about concentration of a toxin, a, a pesticide in fish's body. F is concentration in fish's body which is solid body. So, in solids when we talk about ppm, we are talking about mass by mass. So, when I say 
that the concentration in the fish's body allowed is 0.3 ppm. I'm saying the concentration the allowed in fish's body is 0.3 gram by 10 to power 6 gram of fish. Okay, this is important. All right, now let's write the BCF and we'll use the same unit is 5000 liter per kilogram. So again, we need to change the unit. So once you get the units right, you will get 0 0.06 microgram per liter. So I've converted it into microgram, it's easier. So this is the concentration of the contaminant that is permissible in water. Now before we move ahead, take a look at the students. The concentration of the contaminant that should be there in the water for fish to be safe for consuming is 0 0.06 microgram per liter. We can write this in ppm too. So in ppm, remember ppm is parts per million and microgram per liter is parts per million for fluid mass by volume. So we can say this is 0 0.06 parts per million. So if we just compare parts per million to parts per million, we see that the concentration of the contaminant in fish's body is 0.3 parts per million. When it is in the water, it is 0 0.06 parts per million. It seems to have increased in the fish's body almost five times lower in the water. So there is literally concentration of the contaminant happening in the fish's body. So no wonder we call it bioconcentration. Okay. Coming back to this, now we have found out the concentration that is permissible in water, 0 0.06 ppm. Now let us find out the total concentration of pesticide allowed in the water body. Here's a question before we move ahead. Why are we interested in the total concentration of pesticide in the water body when it is much easier for us to just filter water sample and find the concentration in the water, not in the particulate matter? So think about it. I hope you guessed it correct because um, the simple answer to this is that as um, policy people, as industry effluent managing people, it is easier for us to know what total amount mass of contaminant was released into the lake than actually measuring and on a regular basis what is the level of contaminant in the water, so what would be in the particulate matter, so what would be permissible. So what amount is permissible to release is more important for us. Okay, let's go ahead and find CT. So we know CW, we need to find CP. Now the way I'm going to do is I'm going to use the fraction FD. So if you remember from previous lecture, I defined FD as the fraction of contaminant that is in the dissolved fraction. So basically CW to CP, right? And we know that FD is equal to 1 by 1 plus KFPW. Now KF is your solid water partitioning coefficient, PW is the concentration of your particulate matter, which we have here 20 milligram per liter. We have KF here 10,000 liter per gram. So we can find out FD. Remember, keep the units consistent. When we do that, our FD comes out to be 0 0.83. So the fraction of the contaminant in dissolved form is 0.83. 1 minus 0.83 is the fraction in the particulate matter. So now we want to find out total. Remember, total is CT is equal to CW per CP, which means CT will be equal to CW divided by 0 0.83, right? So we know CW and we just divide it by 0 0.83 and we'll get it 0 0.07 microgram per liter or 0 0.07 parts per million. Okay, so this is the total concentration of the contaminant that is permissible in the lake for fish in the lake to be safe for consumption. Okay, students, so this is all we wanted, I wanted to cover for environmental non-reactive processes. The next we are going to cover environmental reactive processes. So, So environmental reactive processes is when the chemical reaction is happening and we need to incorporate that in our model. We need to incorporate that either in our ODE model or in our mass balance model. So in this case, we can have general chemical reactions happening. We can have uh, transformation of pollutants into secondary pollutants. We can have degradation of contaminants. And typically what we teach in our BTEC classes, in our bachelor classes, undergrad, and also sometimes in a postgrad are typically the first order decay because they are very easy to model. Sometimes occasionally zero order, occasionally second order. But when you are doing, when you're trying to make your model really realistic and as close to reality as possible, you might run into scenarios 
where first order zero order is not the answer and you may go into higher order reactions. So very briefly let me explain to you how to write rate constraints what they mean for reactive processes before we move ahead. So let us say we have a reaction and the reaction looks like this A is transforming into B and then some part of B is transforming back into A right. So this is an equilibrium scenario where the reaction is moving in both directions from A to B from B to A. However, the rate at which it moves from A to B is and from B to A they, these two rates vary. So let us say um, the rate at which forward reaction is happening is Rf and the rate at which backward reaction is happening is Rb and of course that equilibrium Rf will be equal to Rb so it will appear that really there is no change in the concentration of A and B but it is an appearance remember it is still happening but Rf is equal to Rb. Okay, how will we write Rf? Rate of forward reaction will be equal to will be proportional to the molarity the concentrations of the reactants which in this case is A. So these are square brackets and in chemistry square brackets indicate molarity, molarity not molality. Okay, so Rf is going to be proportional to A molarity so we can say Rf is equal to some constant Kf which is the con rate constant for forward reaction A. Now let us look at the rate for backward reaction it is going to be proportional to concentration of B. So notice one thing when we are going from A to B the rate at which A transforms into B is proportional to A. When we are going from B to A the rate is proportional to B right so it is always proportional to the um, level to the concentration to the molarity of your reactant. So Rb is equal to Kb which is backward reaction rate constant molarity of B. Now if we again come back to A right we want to find out how the concentration how the molarity of A is changing with time right. So we need to account for both the forward rate and the backward rate or the rate of forward reaction and the rate of backward reaction. So once again doing the mass balance the rate at which A is changing in the reactor with time is equal to input minus output plus accumulation minus decay. So the rate at which A is changing with time input is 0 because it is a batch reactor output is 0 because it is a batch reactor so both of these are 0. Accumulation is the rate at which A is increasing now since we are looking at A not B the rate uh, at which A is increasing is because of backward reaction which is plus Kb B the minus dk the rate at which A is decreasing which is forward reaction minus Kfa. So this is your rate reaction for A now let us write a similar reaction equation for B. For B it is going to be very similar no input no output so input is 0 output is 0. Now rate at which B is accumulating is given by plus Kfa rate at which B is degrading is minus Kbb. So it is very similar to dA by dt just re reverse in the sign. Now what happens at equilibrium? At equilibrium A and B will have equilibrium concentration they will concentration will not change. So both dA by dt and dB by dt will become equal to 0. Now in that scenario when they become equal to 0 what we are getting is Kfa is equal to Kbb right. So Kf by Kb is equal to B by A okay. We have brought the rate constants on one side and we have brought the molarity of the reactant and product on other side. Now if I know the concentration of A at equilibrium I can find out the concentration of B using this equation. What we like to do is we like to summarize Kf by Kb as a new constant K which is product on the top concentration at equilibrium divided by reactant concentration at equilibrium in the denominator. This is known as equilibrium constant. So if you look at it this way equilibrium constant is nothing it is a ratio of forward reaction divided by backward reaction. This is a very simple example. In the next class I will talk about the rule of thumb for how to look at a simple chemi chemical equation and look at the stoichiometry of that chemical equation and use that to write your equilibrium constants. Alright students that is all for this class see you in the next lecture. Thank you.